All right, it's day zero of this Grow Your Own Century plant series. So some type of uh, agave that's famed for its inflorescence that can get really, really tall. I have uh, some video footage of that thing getting, you know, uh, way up there, maybe above 10 meters in height. Um, not sure on the exact range, but those are the seeds. So anyway, let's see, we have six right there, 13 seeds. And I'm gonna plant them in some soil. So if we spin around, you know, I have a pot that I tried to grow some refrigerated ginseng seeds in and didn't pan out at all. There are still some dry seeds in there despite all the watering and being in the fridge for a year. I'm just going to plant these at various depths, uh, you know, within probably two or three centimeters at the most and some uh, more shallow. And then I'm going to water and wait, you know, for two or three weeks to see if anything happens. So I moved that up here and let's just get started. You know, this is still very moist. Uh, some seeds can go deeper than others, like I said. But yeah, I'll just pour water from the top and provide enough moisture to hopefully get these desert plants started. Um, this is sort of a desert environment right now in San Diego. It's really hot. It's August. Uh, maybe this is prime season. Well, maybe not prime, but... You know, if I add some water, the kind of environment that these will like for germination. And it's kind of hard to keep track of, you know, where the seeds are exactly. And if I water, you know, this is heat sterilized potting mix from stores. And it's got some dirt and diatomaceous earth mixed in there. I mean, some sand. Let's see, that's nine already. Might be covering some redundant areas, but yeah, that that one can be pretty shallow. Yeah, I don't really know how this will turn out, but just give it a go. And when things start sprouting visibly, I can sprinkle some sand over the top too. But for now, I think if I compact this, That'll be fine. You know, I don't want things to shift around. So give it a pretty hard compaction and just pour water from the top. All right, I'm back. I have some distilled water in a spray bottle. And I'm just going to use that to spray water. This is already quite moist, but, uh, it has started drying out a little bit despite my watering just a few days ago so I'm just going to use a spray bottle and make sure these seeds get plenty of water over the next two or three weeks and hopefully they'll germinate quickly so yeah stay tuned for a further update all right it's only day 14 of this century plant series I haven't covered on any sand uh, haven't really had a fungus snap problem but as you can see there's one shoot right there so let's bring that up for a closer examination all right so it's only been two weeks uh, that's less than I expected for something like this to germinate from seed but we have it here you know it's our first and it's on the side of the pot not optimal position but the first mover advantage is pretty significant in a place like the desert and as you can see unlike the Joshua tree leaves it's not stuff sort of like you know blades of grass or whatever and try to focus on this stuff you know they're not thin from the profile this is just fleshy throughout so I can't wait to see what happens with this. Uh, the top looks a little burned already. You know, it's 
kind of unavoidable whenever I grow plants. Things like that happen at the leaf tips. Uh, this pot, you know, the soil seems moist, but this watering tray is completely dry again. So, you know, I have this watering can and I can get more water. I just used a bunch to water everything else. You know, I've also watered a little bit from the top, but absorption is so good in this soil mixture. I can just do this and uh, get more water and fill that up because these uh, small plants, uh, potters, I mean, dry up really fast. So uh, stay tuned to my channel for further updates. Please subscribe. And it might be a long time before we see anything significant. So it might take a few weeks from now to get an update. All right, thanks for watching. Stay tuned. All right, it's day 111. It's a beautiful day in early December, December 5th, 2015. You know, it's been eight weeks since my last update. But this plant is normally lying on my balcony floor in a place where it gets more sun, although in December, probably only two hours a day at best, if not even less. There are three leaves now and it sort of looks like that's actually a second plant popping out instead of a third leaf but it seems a little bit too early to tell maybe this is just the way they grow um, I'm not going to burrow in there and find out what's happening I'm just gonna let this thing go at its glacial pace until something more happens one remedy I have is possibly to get you know some kind of uh, cheapo wire cage I can hang over the side I've seen this with some other people's uh, plants and basically have the plant hang over the rail of the balcony then it could get a lot more sun per day and you know as for watering I just do that a few drops from my watering can you have know, distilled water and it just soaks in that kind of mimics the infrequent desert rain situation in Southern California and that's basically it Welcome back. This is the fourth episode in the series. This is some repeat footage from the end of last episode for comparison against what you're about to see. Because on day 260, 149 days later, it looks zombified. Coloration's all off if you compare it especially to the orange seedling in the center of this pot, which had an ill fate in the end. Granted, this was all filmed at dusk on a cloudy day, but you can see the green color is all off it's not there the outsides of these two blades two outer ones is um, yeah I don't know how to describe that color but it's a sickly looking color by a day 266 middle blade looked larger and healthier I had watered sparingly throughout this entire series up until this point because as was the case in my Joshua trees growing series 4 out of 10 germinated and out of those four seedlings of Joshua trees uh, three of them quickly succumbed within weeks to root rot or was it maybe a few months at the most so on day 280 I decided to indulge in some flood watering which was you know just my fancy way of describing using this watering can with a liter capacity to thoroughly soak the entire pot this is a I wouldn't say a small pot, but it's a medium pot, uh, smaller than all my other pots that I'm currently using for plant series. With potting mix, everything shifts around like this when you use anything that has the nozzle capacity higher than a squirt bottle. So all the dirt shifted around, plant itself shifts around, which is very bad for the root system. Some plant root systems can't tolerate that. I don't know if this is one of those cases. But nobody up until this point was really interested in viewing this century plant growing series, so I had nothing to lose. So on day 288, with some of my plants, I decided to try this aspirin treatment by buying some low-dose chewable aspirin, 81 milligrams per pill. Normally it's 325, which people say on the internet they use as a dose in one gallon of water. And that translates to this low dose of 81 milligrams of aspirin in one liter of water. So this watering can can fit almost a liter, slightly over 900 mLs. I'm trying this aspirin dissolved in water idea for all of my plant series concurrently. 
because one of my viewers recently suggested this. I looked up the idea on the internet and saw some, I wouldn't call it evidence, but anecdotal evidence, uh, videos, blogs, and whatnot that suggested that aspirin could do great things for my plants. Well, I mean, there is science behind it because the aspirin will be metabolized by plants into salicylic acid, a plant hormone that's naturally concentrated in willow bark used as a painkiller. So at this point, you can see the base of the outer leaf that's smaller on the right side. That thing doesn't look good. It looks like it's about to rot. Although the green color has come back, it's uh, very late in spring. So there's been a lot more sunshine on this balcony. But I think the watering, the flood watering, really helped. So I'm going to do some more flood watering. But yeah, getting back to the aspirin, um, it could potentially act as a hormone that will absorb in minute quantities into the foliage itself and also get into the root system. It's supposed to help prevent root rot, um, make the plants resistant to bugs and diseases, and sort of act as a cure-all, although I'm sure you know fertilization is another part of the equation as well as sunlight, carbon dioxide, etc. So I'm doing more uh, pseudo flood watering just locally here to see if I can get an additional response. This is aspirin water though, so I imagine hopefully that it will stop this from getting root rot with all this watering. That's definitely a concern. I didn't want to take risks at the beginning of this series with just one plant. So you could see the whole plant was shifting around just then and I'm using a squirt bottle for a gentler application to wash off the dirt particles. It's also annoying to have sand in the pot. So I'm going to use some fertilizer now that it's been a few days since I applied the aspirin water on day 297. Macronutrients of plants are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus compounds. In useful compound forms. These are the macronutrients that plants need. A lot of plants need nitrogen fixing bacteria to get their nitrogen in the soil. Some plants have a symbiotic relationship in their root nodules and whatnot. With nitrogen fixing bacteria, they can just directly pull molecular nitrogen out of the air and create compounds out of it that plants can use. So it comes in these blue crystals. I've had this package forever. It doesn't go bad or anything. And I'm dissolving it with small amounts of aspirin water to soak it into the soil and disperse it. Although it's often said that you don't want to apply fertilizer in concentrated form to the foliage because it'll cause burns. It'll absorb in there. So I'm doing a lot of rinsing to get rid of that and that should render the leaves squeaky clean again. So back what I was saying about sand is uh, grains will get between the blades of these succulent plants which is really annoying because you're worried that they'll cause scratches between the leaf blades as they grow and expand and also just cause other developmental problems with the plants. So the sand was originally in there just to prevent fungus gnats. It was a layer on top. So I'm doing all this rinsing that should do the trick. You know, it looks like it sort of forms an organic cup in the middle, but the moment I stop this stream of fluid, it drains very quickly. On day 301, more aspirin watering is done, and you can see the response of the plant from all this aspirin watering. It looks far more green, uh, far more succulent and lush than it did before. So we're doing pretty good. Um, even with a squirt bottle watering, if I do it too violently, uh, dirt particles get everywhere. So I have to just be careful. I could try to brush some of that stuff aside, but then I would weaken the support around the base. and It could potentially shift around, which is probably bad. But in the case of this century plant, we haven't seen any signs of bad things being caused by that. No damage, definitely. 
and the blade tips were burned before but with all that water swelling they seem fine now so day 303 this is the first time I'm trying my vitamin idea so vitamins contain all the micronutrients a plant can need uh, this is for me obviously a human so you know we don't necessarily have the same needs in terms of micronutrients I'm not sure that plants need all those vitamins but I have seen blogs on the internet that say um, vitamin solutions in pretty dilute concentrations too because really concentrated ones can be very expensive but vitamin pills are cheap I'm crushing this up with pliers as a demo putting in a squirt bottle and then I'll put in some water and start shaking it to mix it so that makes it an easy vitamin solution granted there are some insoluble things in there that are lipid soluble people talk about that and in relation to vitamins and how if you don't eat fat or oil with your vitamins then you're not getting all of them but anyway uh, for plants you know in their natural environment they don't really encounter oils lipids in the soil so I'm figuring all they need are the water soluble vitamins and minerals all those trace amounts of metals you know whatever nickel iron manganese uh, the pill itself is made of calcium carbonate so that should provide for tons of that which succulents are said to need a lot of to build cell walls so yeah after this uh, vitamin application you know the first application was four days ago this is day 307 you know I'm applying it again and the plant looks yet bigger leaves have swollen up more the fourth blade is coming out and it's bigger it was kind of nested in there for a while and it seemed very small so like with my Joshua tree it seems like you know sometimes there's hope of rapid continuous growth but then you see a leaf just stuck in there for days or even weeks and you start to lose heart again but this has been a lot of progress since the beginning of the video definitely compared to the last video the coloration is completely different now the blades act as water storage organs they swell up like the blades of aloe and the base of that outermost leaf is actually you know it doesn't look sickly maybe it's kind of obscured now that everything is swollen and it's been pushed underground but you know it's interesting how the you know the big leaf on the left of what we're looking at right now it's serrated whereas you know the small one on the left big one on the right aren't so are those cotyledons I don't know but there's a fourth blade coming out and it looked a lot thinner a few days ago so I assume the plant is doing very well it's soaking up as much water as it can I was worried about overwatering with my succulent plants and as a result I didn't see much growth for a really long time because I was underwatering out of that fear of killing all my plants with root rot so now that I know that this is very uh, flood tolerant essentially I can water as much as I want at least that's what I think for the time being here's another angle you can see the interesting serrated spiral sort of looks like a missile head it's very aesthetic so I think I got the hang of growing um, this century plant here's some macro footage I definitely think I can get a lot more growth out of this going forward and not spend a whole century to grow something at an imperceptibly slow rate like I did for the first I think six months or whatever you know first nine months maybe so I'm just spraying with some distilled water in the end to wash off any possible vitamin residue I don't know that it would be harmful like it would be with a fertilizer but it doesn't hurt definitely to be a little bit more cautious Please check out my Century Plant playlist and stay tuned for episodes in the future. Welcome back. It's day 313. I crushed a men's health one a day vitamin pill for adults in one liter of water. These are the vitamin pills that I normally take. And I'm stirring it with a metal chopstick in my red metal watering pail. And I'm essentially fertilizing from the bottom. 
this should provide all the micronutrients my plants need but if I had to do this all over again I'd do it from the top because as I water from the top the nutrients can travel downwards um, putting in the tray means you need roots in there to get at the nutrients so on day 318 I put half a packet of miracle Grow singles in the same metal watering can with another liter of water to dissolve it and this should provide all the macronutrients that the plant needs uh, the nitrogen compounds, phosphorus compounds and potassium compounds in usable forms you can't just put it in elemental you would wreck everything so I'm watering away from the plant on the top in hopes that I don't want to burn the leaves or the roots by direct contact with concentrated fertilizer and I sprayed some distilled water all over tops and sides to try to wash off anything that might have splashed on the leaves this is macro footage of the plant up close so it's lonely in this pot it's just this one plant and I had many seeds to begin with but as with many plant growing series I end up with one you know through attrition or just one that germinated and you can see the teeth on the sides uh, the ends are burned but that's okay because uh, most desert plants end up with burned leaf ends where their spike is it has a really high surface area to volume ratio so it probably just dries out so it's day 321 macro footage of these leaves again a few days later modeled with the white spots in case you've never looked at century plant leaves up close although the adults the mature plants look quite different from this but you probably won't find footage like this anywhere else you know you'll just find something granny on the web so why not show you what it looks like when they're young it's day 338 I'm watering from the top away from the plant again in hopes of the plant sending out uh, roots you know adventitious shoots etc so on day 350 I added one low dose 81 milligram tablet that's dissolvable of aspirin I had heard about aspirin watering and how contact with the leaves with the appropriate concentration of aspirin water will boost plant immunity and make them grow faster so this was my phase during 2016 together with the avocado navel orange seed where I was basically doing this to all my plants so this isn't some kind of special treatment for just the century plant it's just along for the ride um, my initial century plant episodes were very short and I didn't put that much effort into them and I don't know either it's that or people don't really want to watch um, videos on succulents but Later on I had an episode, the one right before this, it covers days 100 something to 307, you know, 111 to 307 I think it was, and that one got a decent amount of viewership. Um, I made it a much longer episode, uh, 12 minutes I think, and it got 800 views over 8 months, which is not good compared to my other series, but it's a definite spike in interest. Um, just due to the higher quality of the video compared to the very early episodes so it seems like uh, viewership will pick up a little bit and some people have commented that they want to see more episodes or they just commented on the century plant series in general in 2017 so I think people want to see more of this uh, day 391 so I've been flood watering from the top a lot and I don't really have a fear of root rot. Um, I guess part of that is I'm not really afraid of losing this plant because if I do, you know, not a relatively high number of people are watching it anyway. So, you know, it's not a huge loss. So I'm just kind of hoping that this plant starts to grow faster. And I'm not really concerned about root rot. It seems like once plants get to this phase, They've been alive for a while, um, past the early seedling phase. They're no longer afraid of root rot. So your problem might be underwatering rather than overwatering. 
And all this fear of overwatering came from a phase uh, much earlier than this where, you know, I lost a lot of plants due to overwatering. I think that was 2015. You know, the Joshua tree seedlings uh, all died and whatnot. So it's day 413. And as I stated, uh, underwatering was probably the bigger problem in the past and overwatering. But with just an N of 1, I only have one sample here. I don't really know uh, the water tolerance of this plant. But I would think most uh, succulents like this that have fat, juicy leaves, um, they just like to store a lot of water and use it at their leisure. And I can't imagine that, uh, well, maybe they just don't encounter overwatering in their natural environment. But you never know. I mean, there could be a, a little microclimate where, you know, at the base of a rocky mountain or whatever, it just gets a lot of water and it might actually have to contend with a lot of water under the ground. So today, 445, slow growth during winter. So this episode spans uh, fall and winter pretty much. And there's just not enough growth, in my opinion, because there's not enough sunlight Although the beginning is probably just very slow in general for this plant, like it was for the Joshua tree. So if I had, um, you know, a townhouse or a house or whatever with a, a balcony or a yard that got morning sun too, and didn't have to wait until early afternoon to start getting sun, then I would have a much bigger plant by now. But, you know, you have what you have you can't change that and uh, my balcony can't just magically protrude out and have no overhang so you know now I'm spraying the leaves because I like to clean the leaves off uh, they get dusty especially when I do work on the balcony with dirt you know it just lands on everything um, static and whatnot so you can see there's a little leaf um, you know on the bottom that was uh, one of the first few leaves and it just got obscured and the plant sort of grew downwards, so I'll talk more about later. But yeah, so I started watering more like this, and you know I'm not really afraid of disturbing anything in the pot, but at the same time it kind of annoyed me early on in this growing series to water directly on the plant because uh, all these dirt particles, uh, vermiculite and whatnot, would just get wedged between the leaves. So it's day 562, and as I said, over time plant got deeper and I think the first two leaves um, are obscured or dead uh, I think there's one that you can see underneath uh, the biggest leaf but I got this new plastic showering can and it's been great and I can just water like this and it doesn't disturb all the soil so that removes all the annoyance of all these uh, potting mix particles just kind of moving around and getting into everything but I think watering like this about once a week is good enough for these succulents or the Joshua tree. Basically, you want the soil wet but um, not soaking wet, and you don't want the bottom watering tray to be constantly flooded either. That's just my opinion. So you can see this thing is really green and dark now. The leaves are actually significantly bigger and more in number than they were in the beginning of this episode. So there's been a fair bit of progress. The teeth actually have colors to them. You know, they're an interesting red, um, sort of a maybe dark reddish brown um, on tips and yellow at the base. So it adds a lot of character to that. Um, they look different than they were earlier on in this episode or compared to the previous episodes, the starter episodes. So um, yeah, it's uh, really come a long way. It's day 570. I'm looking forward to the day where this plant will take up the entire pot or most of it and have runners going out and colonizing all the remaining empty space, available real estate. That's kind of lonely and boring for the time being. But it'll take a long time before this thing can even approach the appearance of what I see in landscaping projects. I read that it takes 25 years for this thing to reach maturity. On average, it doesn't take a hundred, um, despite the name. So by then, it will send out a huge showy inflorescence that can reach, 
you know, 10, maybe even 15 meters high in some specimens and have all sorts of pollinating insects buzzing around the top. You know, it's a big show for a few weeks before everything withers away and it makes seeds. But it will reproduce largely by vegetative growth. By cloning itself, it sends out runners, adventitious shoots, to, um, you know, make new shoots uh, elsewhere. And after the main plant dies, um, that's how it carries on the entire cycle for another 25 years. So thanks for watching, and it'll be a very long time until the next episode, so stay tuned to the rest of my channel. It's day 646. I've been watering frequently. There's not much change. I think the root system is a lot more mature than it was in year one or the first few months, so I'm not afraid to water more. Plus this pot is just small compared to the others, so it really doesn't hold that much moisture. You know, I can have the bottom watering tray fill up if I keep watering like this. I tend to use distilled water because uh, not much water volume goes in this and I don't want to salt up the soil over a very long period of time. But, um, you know, if I ever do, I could always just flush it out with lots and lots of tap water. So sometimes the tray overflows. This is day 669. There's a big weed in this pot. You know, that wasn't there just a few weeks ago. So as you can see, life cycles come and go as this thing grows at a glacial pace. If you know what this weed is, uh, please let me know in the comments. It's just interesting. Um, I'm not really good with weed names and identifying them. There's so many plant species out there, especially in a place like Southern California, where uh, a lot of things can grow invasive or native. So there's just a lot of biodiversity around here. And I think this is just from some wild seed that blew in. Uh, the root system could be more extensive than that, but you know, when you pull like that, you probably just rip up all the secondary smaller roots and destroy a lot of the root hairs. So I'm just going to cut that up. I didn't show that part, but uh, here we are. You know, it just looks like a salad now. You have the roots there. Um, I think there shouldn't be any harm in just letting that dry out at the top and. I've had experience with this with my passion fruit vine. You know, in a month you won't even be able to see it. I think in this particular case, you know, just in two weeks it was kind of hard to see. So it's day 679. There's a new weed. I think it might be the same species. I forgot how the other one looked, but it was kind of similar. I think this didn't happen in the first five or six hundred days um, prior to me watering very generously every try to do it like every two days sometimes it goes a week but you can see a, a water spot from using tap water sometimes the demand for distilled water is too great so I just saw a hummingbird fly away I heard it hovering you can't really hear it in the video I think it's investigating my balcony um, it's claimed my balcony as its territory so if you are ever in the wild around here and you're just sitting near a bunch of uh, plants or wildflowers especially sometimes a hummingbird will come and hover very close to you to investigate. I think it knows it can't do anything, but I'm not sure if it's aware that I'm the one who's uh, providing for these plants in the first place. But, you know, I think they check it out every once in a while for rival hummingbirds and just try to chase them off and mark their territory. So when they do have flowers, eventually, you know, they get really excited and check out the flower buds probably every day. So I added some miracle Grow fertilizer for vegetative growth. I have too many plant series going on currently and it's beginning to take too much time to compile 10 minute to 12 minute videos. Thus I'm going back to a much shorter format to keep you informed and updated. So please like my Facebook page if you want to see additional pictures and content that's not on my YouTube channel. Hello and welcome back. It's day 713 of this Growing Century Plant from Seed series. I have my fertilizer, Tums for calcium carbonate, and vitamin pill, all distributed out for several plants. Been fertilizing a lot lately. Realized that in 2017 and in years past, I erred on the side of too little fertilization. So back to the main topic: the century plant is growing. You can see these neat red spikes at the ends of the newer leaves. And this dandelion that was once very small is now larger in overall reach than the century plant. Although the century plant has these fat succulent leaves, 
it has a lot more mass and capacity to store water. I'm going to show you something interesting later. And I'm not going to water too hard initially. I just want to dissolve the Miracle Grow fertilizer, the kind I use for encouraging vegetative growth, since nothing here is close to flowering anyway. And it was just more work and cleanup to crush the vitamins with a pair of pliers. So there's a pair, well, not a pair, it's just one dead leaf down there. That's a first for the century plant. It serves no function. It's completely obscured, so it gets no sunlight underneath the leaves above it. And it's prone to rot since it's pressed against potty mix. And it's just going to be wet all the time, like it is now. For extended periods of time. So you can see the vitamin pill getting a little soggy and I'm doing further watering later. Miracle Grow has long dissolved. Don't want to overwater this pot but it has an advantage in that it dries out very quickly so even when you do overwater things will be okay very quickly so there won't be root rot in such a small pot. So I saw what looks like a fat rice noodle or it's just a fat generic noodle. That's the tap root of this dandelion plant. I know they look different in the East Coast and in other parts of the United States, but that's how it looks like here. All right, it's day 741 of this series. This dandelion, as we've been calling it, has now dominated the entire pot. It's on its second and third flowers. Flowers actually open and close and the main stalk wilts and becomes erect depending on hydration. So I hydrated by flood watering this until the water came running out of the bottom watering tray. I think it may be so thistle. It's got foliage that's unique. I've never seen anything like this. It's got a very unique set of features. If it's so thistle, then supposedly it's a wild edible with leaves that taste quite good. And those hairs with the black globules at the end remind me of sundew plants that trap insects and eat them, but this isn't a carnivorous plant, obviously. Something related to a dandelion. It's got many more flowers on the way, and it has great difficulty in maintaining hydration. It wilts whenever the sun hits it. In this case, I overwatered in the morning and brought this pot up onto the observation deck just for a quick spin and to do some filming. But otherwise than that, it's got these white tufts here that don't look like a fungal infection. They just seem like some sort of weird natural feature that serves some bizarre otherworldly uh, purpose that I don't know of. So the foliage is very unique. This thing is taking up all the room and it can't support itself. And at some point I'm going to have to pull this and it's so close to the century plant which seems to have deflated leaves they're competing for water and the sow thistle is hogging up all the water and still not enough. So when I pull this thing eventually I may very well pull up the century plant as well. And I think this series has gone on for a very long time. It's not that popular but it does have a following. I'll be sad to see this thing go but people have made requests for many other cacti species. I'd like to see the seeds and the end of blooming for the sow thistle until I make a move and I might still keep the century plant around. Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's day 760. This weed has gone on unchecked for long enough. It's got those seed pods much like dandelions. I still think this is sow thistle. In any case it doesn't warrant enough effort to do a thorough investigation. I'm not going to sequence the genome of this thing just to know what it is. If any of you know, uh, please write so in the comments. To me, it's not that important. It's uh, very dandelion-like, very weedy, but nothing like a normal dandelion. So I'm shaking all the seeds off, and they float away just like dandelion seeds do. The uh, seed pods, if you can call them that, are not as uh, spherical and bushy. They're more part of a sphere. So I'm pulling this, and I realized that the root system is actually very weak and sparse. It's surprising yet not surprising because I thought the tap root went all the way to the watering tray. I must have broken it off and as you can see here it's already reproduced. I did a shaking. I tried to get most of the seeds from the first 
seed pod off the balcony, but that's what happened. And there's already four, so it's reproduced in this pot and outside this pot. And this all reminds me of how sandy the soil is. I made this potting mix with sand mixture uh, two years ago, and you can see a spider that escaped. It's a refugee now. I don't know where the spider went. I didn't follow where it went. It's probably made a home elsewhere on my balcony with one of my other plants. So I'm just cutting this up, shaking all the detritus and uh, filth off the balcony. And there's uh, another one or two of these tiny little seedlings. So this thing has a very high rate of fecundity. It hasn't been in this pot for that long. I think just was it two episodes or three episodes. So this is a very sandy mixture. It's got terrestrial algae or moss or whatever in there. So let's have a look at that tap root and the watering tray. It's kind of hard to reach with two fingers given the opening is so small, but do my best. So I'm reaching in there and it took a bit of effort, but I managed to pull this out. So that looks like a very healthy tap root. Uh, it's very reminiscent of dandelion tap roots back when I was a kid and I lived in New York State. So out here in California, I don't really see those uh, stereotypical dandelions that I saw back there. But there are other species that are similar. So I'm going to comb my fingers through this and try my best to dislodge from the bottom with a few fingers. And I'm trying to not use too much force because I don't want to rip this thing, its root system, to shreds and hear this loud, uh, devastating break of roots. So it seems like it's anchored in there pretty solidly. These things can grow to be the size of cars or larger and I'm sure they perhaps weigh much more because they're solid in volume. They have a lot more water weight. Maybe not as much as a large car but I've seen ones that absolutely could not ever be lifted by a human because they're so unwieldy and in the very least weigh at least half a ton or probably a ton because they've got so much water in there. So it's a fairly robust plant and even in this small pot I imagine those thick ropey roots are dug and entrenched into the narrow slits that lead into the watering tray even though the watering tray is dry most of the time. So I found this thing. That's pretty interesting because it seems to me that this is a runner from the century plant but the green tip was facing downwards it seems or maybe I just disturbed everything and broke it off and flipped it upside down so this is actually part of the root system and that means that so-called weed tap root that I broke off earlier was actually part of the century plant too and now it all starts to make a lot more sense because the weed had such a weak um, feeble root system that it was drooping non-stop every day when the sun would hit that thing would droop and it was too tall for its own good so now I can easily see why it wasn't getting enough water although the century plants roots only covered you know maybe a good 30 percent of the soil volume here it didn't form a giant root ball with the entire pot it is a slow growing plant but this reminds me of the yerba mansa finale episode where I have all these very healthy looking thick white roots that are very ropey in nature and here you can get good physiology um, video and lesson for the century plant which you probably won't find anywhere else on the web in 4k resolution so you can see the bottom here so the plant has a very healthy uh, root to shoot ratio I would say it's very robust all over it's just a very tough plant and it has done very well in this sandy loam or whatever you want to call it it's just sand mixed with potting mix and I bet it's got a lot of diatomaceous earth from you know when I was using that stuff on everything to deal with fungus gnats because I didn't sterilize my potting mix two to three years ago or didn't sterilize it adequately so that's a good 
uh, view of all the roots and I'm not going to dislodge all the dirt and the root ball because I want to first comb in there and see if there's anything else uh, any other runners that I may have missed any oddities and you know I combed in there and since it's very small volume of soil and I didn't want to unleash or displace this potentially contaminated soil that might have a parasites or anything in there because it's been in use for so long into one of my existing sterilization trays that I used to uh, use for baking spotty mix in the oven so I'm gonna dig a deep hole I didn't find any other oddities any runners and I decided I want to center this in the pot first of all because for two years this thing has been on the side it's been in a bad position and not only that I want to have it kind of on a synthetic hill and be poking up well over the top of the rim of this pot so it gets more sunlight that's the other problem the rim creates a shadow and this thing was so low lying to the ground that it lost maybe its first few leaves due to rot they were wet and embedded in the soil and just unable to photosynthesize after these newer bigger leaves came up so I'm sweeping the uh, residual dirt off the table and putting it back in the pot if anything's contaminated it's all contaminated there's no point in you know being extra careful at this point so I'm pushing all that down and since I loosened everything it's not quite as high as I imagined it would be or I would like it to be but I'm planting that runner in what I think is the correct orientation it's fairly robust but I took my care not to break it and I'm gonna have it poking up about an inch higher than where I think it should be exposed and after this I'm going to get some dry new potting mix after I switch gloves so I don't transfer any parasites from the old potting mix into the new and I'll basically make a big mess of course but I can wash all of this off later so now the century plant can get a lot more sunlight nutrition and better drainage going forward of course there is a question of can it get enough sunlight being on the floor of the balcony I'll address that later and I'll show you but for the time being it's been pretty productive I have all this stuff raised now it's in the center and I have the very tip of what I believe to be a runner exposed and I'm very curious to see if that'll become a new plant I think it will it seems like a fairly robust root and now I'm going to wash off the majority of this loose and dry potting mix and later on I used a fine brush and some additional watering to get off all the dirt that's been wedged in between the lower leaves for basically the better part of the last year so I'm going to also fertilize a little bit I have a squirt bottle that has a little bit of miracle Grow dissolved in it and some vitamin in it and I don't have the footage here but later on I use a squirt bottle to uh, mildly fertilize with low volumes for both the runner and the main plant and then I watered a little bit more so hopefully that I'll get things started and this is just a good washing to get rid of all the dirt and later on I use the towel and clean the outside so I moved my succulents off the balcony floor I made this decision right afterwards because they weren't getting enough sunlight so it was a simple solution really I just moved this entire table forward by about five or six inches and that afforded me enough room to have all five pots in a staggered fashion so now everything gets lots of sunlight all right it stays 767 the runner tip is progressing nicely it's greening and it's unfolding it's clearly differentiating and I'll show you a few close-up looks later but for the meantime the parent plant is doing okay it doesn't seem to be thriving I can't really tell if it's growing it has a small leaf that's uh, dying off which is a natural process or it could just be suffering from transplant shock but I sprayed everything on my balcony all my plants with spectricide triazicide pyrethrin analogs pyrethrins are a class of organic insecticides that come from chrysanthemum flowers they've been known to kill insects for thousands of years 
So the parent plant may be suffering from transplant shock. It's too early to tell that leaf is dying. And the runner, which has a few inches of length, at least it's 10 centimeters long, if not longer. As I recall, it's doing quite well. So it's day 777, and you can see a second leaf dying. The runner is doing better than ever. It has all the makings of a baby century plant. So I suppose if you encounter a century plant in your local landscaping in the southwest United States or somewhere else, you could just break off one of those adventitious shoots. You'll often see a lot of adventitious shoots growing at the base of a car-sized century plant and they're not going to let those grow to fruition anyway. In landscaping, they just transplant, um, maybe every year even, if uh, it sends out inflorescence and dies after a showy, spectacular show of bloom. So a second leaf is dying off. That's okay because it's mostly covered by the leaves above it anyway. It wasn't receiving much sunlight. They do have leaves that die off after a while, even though I've raised the elevation of everything, it's quite ironic that there was bottom two small leaves that were once stuck against the wet mud all the time and now receive more light. They're dying right now instead of long ago. But I think those smaller leaves that were half buried were on their way to being expendable and discarded by the plant. A long time ago so I don't think I changed much but I would be very worried if some of the bigger leaves that were very functional started dying as well and over the next few weeks we'll see what degree of transplant shock the parent plant has experienced so at this point this plant growing series is just an experiment to see what kind of transplant shock the parent plant will experience in the coming weeks and how this runner will develop and possibly grow into an, an independent plant. It looks like it already is. There's a seedling there. I don't know if that's soul thistle or not. I don't think so, but I'm just going to pull it before it gets too big. So this series will be winding up after a few weeks or a few months possibly. And if you have any suggestions on what you'd like to see me grow, possibly another cacti or succulent, please let me know in the comments. Thanks. Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's day 801 of this Growing Century Plants from Seed series. Everything looks great on top and I've decided to end this series so I'm going to excavate and show you the root systems of both this runner that's doing great and its parent plant which is now sprawling out in all directions and growing bigger longer leaves. It wasn't that many days ago when I unfurled um, the second newest leaf from its position, it was stuck due to those uh, fish hook spines it has um, within another leaf's grasp. So that is already standing straight up. It's got another leaf within its embrace. So this time I'll knock away all the potting mix to show you the entire root ball. The most striking feature is that beautiful pale white uh, ivory tusk of a root that's sticking out a 45 degree tangent from the top base of the parent plant. The runner looked a lot whiter than this underground uh, back then and that just goes to show after you do a transplant some kind of damage has been caused or something triggers a external maturation process. Most of the roots turn brownish or beigeish, and they seem to develop layers of I wouldn't say it's bark by any means but some kind of protective covering either that or it's just part of the natural maturation process by which uh, roots gradually lose their function if they've been manhandled like this and then the plant sends out new roots for good reason you can also see a lot more tiny thinner white roots just branching out in all directions to gain access after the giant earthquake, so to speak, the transplant that I did, which shifted everything around and disturbed all the root connections to the potting mix. Potting mix is not like wild soil that has very fine grains of silt that completely cake the surface of the roots. It's basically something that these plants have to burrow into and send out much smaller uh, roots and runners to 
gain access to all that nutrition, all that surface area and water. So you can see the runner has developed quite nicely. It's hard to focus on everything at once. And there's also what looks to be a plant ulcer right above that root where one of the original leaves, uh, the eldest ones, uh, rotted away from moisture, although I'm not sure why it didn't rot away earlier prior to the transplant. Transplants are very stressful on plants. But this is a very hardy species and it seems like it's unfazed largely by the transplant. So it's done really well in these last 40 days. It's had better access to sun. For most of the series it was stuck against the edge of a pot. It was the only seed to germinate from my original gift shop packet. So I just never got around to disturbing it. I didn't want to disturb it. I thought that would be bad for it, but in retrospect, I would say if you're annoyed by the positioning of a century plant, go ahead and do the transplant early on because this is a real champ. It's thrived since and it doesn't seem to be hindered. It's lost two leaves, but it's responded in full to that by generating much more leaf mass. The runner has performed remarkably well independent of its parent plant after being broken off prematurely 40 days ago. That's somewhat of a surprise to me, but given the fleshy, succulent nature of this plant, um, perhaps it wasn't so. I think plants like these have a greater capacity for regeneration. They have more energy reserves, nutrient stores available, especially in their root systems and their fleshy leaves are less likely to dry out if broken off as well. Although I haven't tried that, this is an interesting experiment to break off one of these leaves and see if it will grow into an independent plant. I'm sure people have done that with many other succulent and cacti species. So it's about time to wrap this up. Thank you very much, especially if you're one of the original people who started watching this two years ago starting with episode one. Uh, please keep following my YouTube channel, stay subscribed, and tune in for some other series. I'm trying to get prickly pear cactus to grow from fruit. Thank you for watching.